This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. This afternoon, tens of millions of Americans witnessed a total solar eclipse, a rare occurrence when parts of North America descended into temporary darkness. NTD's Chris Beers is in Syracuse, New York to catch this celestial event of a generation. On Monday, a total solar eclipse crossed through the U.S., Mexico and Canada. A total solar eclipse happens when the moon completely blocks the light of the sun. The sky darkens as if it were dawn or dusk. Here in the U.S., the path of totality passed diagonally from Texas to Maine, but most people in the country will be able to see at least a partial eclipse from where they live. From Indianapolis to Kerrville, Texas, eclipse chasers gathered to get the clearest view of the celestial event. Syracuse, New York is one such prime viewing location just inside the path of totality. Here's what people there told us about their experience. I'm not for sure, I'm, I'm in awe. A, a definite matter of memory for us. It was pitch black at 3 o'clock in the day. <laughs> I thought it was so crazy how this could happen. Incomparable. I think it was a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, it was amazing. Very cool. <laughs> wow. It's all thanks to our EP bio teacher who brought <laughs> us here. The sun's out, but it's not. It's just, it was, it's just magical. I mean, obviously, we were hoping the aliens would come and take us, but you know, no luck. <laughs> we're still here. It was really incredible. It was a core memory, and it was an awesome experience. The program taught us a lot about researching and collecting data, not just for this, but for other things, and also taught us a lot about how the eclipse affects the climate and things like that. It particularly impressed me the darkness. Well, it was just like, might as well be 11 o'clock at night. We'll have to stick around and catch the next one right here. <laughs> 55 years from now. 55. Yeah, well, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Totality lasted up to 4 minutes and 28 seconds. The first location in continental North America that experienced totality was Mexico's Pacific Coast. The path of totality then entered the U.S. in Texas around 2.20 p.m. Eastern Time before traveling through multiple states and exiting the U.S. in Maine at around 3.40 p.m. Eastern. Weather permitting, people along the path of totality were able to see the sun's corona or outer atmosphere, which is usually obscured by the bright light of the sun's surface. The solar eclipse prompted authorities in multiple states to issue travel warnings and severe weather alerts. One estimate says the eclipse could generate $6 billion in economic activity as hotels and businesses along the path receive an influx of visitors. Delta Airlines even provided path of totality flights for people to view the experience above the clouds. Throughout history, solar eclipses have held spiritual significance for various religions around the world. Today's cosmic phenomenon comes just days after a rare earthquake shook the East Coast, sparking discussion about the end times and other interpretations. The last total solar eclipse visible in the United States was in 2017. The next won't be until 2044. Reporting from Syracuse, New York, Chris Beers, NTD News. Former President Trump today says in a social media video that he believes abortion laws should be left to the states. The former president stressing there should be exceptions for things like rape and incest. And today's Arlene Richards has more. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights. On Monday, former President Trump gave his official view on abortion in a four and a half minute video. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. The Republican presidential candidate said he supported exceptions for rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. He had previously hinted he could support a 15-week federal ban with those exceptions. In this video, he didn't say at what stage he thought it would be appropriate to ban abortions, but he did give his stance on late-term abortions. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is, the baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable. He also reiterated that he supports the availability of in vitro fertilization. Yet there's pushback from at least one of his supporters. 
top Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who endorsed Trump's 2024 bid, said in a statement on X, I respectfully disagree with President Trump's statement that abortion is a state's rights issue. A prominent anti-abortion group said they were disappointed. Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, said in a statement, We are deeply disappointed in President Trump's position. Unborn children and their mothers deserve national protections and national advocacy from the brutality of the abortion industry. Many Republicans supported Trump's stance, such as House Representatives Greg Murphy, Scott Perry, and Nancy Mace, each agreeing that abortion should be left for the state to decide. In New York, Trump's legal team makes a last-minute appeal just one week before the hush money trial is set to begin. CNN reports that on Monday, defense attorneys filed papers related to the gag order as well as the location of the trial. The team previously disputed the gag order and requested a change of location, arguing that Trump can't get a fair trial in Manhattan. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And this just in, a New York appeals court judge rejected the Trump team's request to delay the trial while they fight to move it out of Manhattan. The trial is scheduled to begin on April 15th. President Biden has announced a new plan to offer student debt relief to millions of Americans. This after the Supreme Court blocked a similar attempt last year. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more details on the White House's new strategy. President Biden announced today a new effort to offer student debt relief to over 30 million people. According to the White House, the plan would entirely eliminate the debt of 4 million borrowers, would eliminate the accrued interest on the debt of 23 million people, and offer up to $5,000 in student debt relief to 10 million other persons. My administration will propose a new rule to cancel up to $20,000 in runaway interest for any borrower that owes more now owes more now than when they started paying the loan. And for low and middle class families enrolled in my SAVE program will cancel all of your interest. The new effort comes less than a year after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's $400 billion student debt relief executive order in June of 2023. President Biden spoke about his new plan during an event in the battleground state of Wisconsin. Vice President Kamala Harris did the same in Pennsylvania. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona spoke at an event in New York State. And Second Gentleman Douglas Emhoff appeared in Arizona. I spoke with Jesus Marquez, co-founder of the American Christian Caucus, and he thinks today's announcement is central to President Biden's re-election strategy. It's done in the middle of a, an election period, an election season, that is meant for that, to buy votes. Biden sees that Donald Trump is up in the polls, and he's trying to incite and revive the a college uh, generation. The Biden administration has already approved over $146 billion in student debt relief, benefiting more than 4 million Americans through more than a dozen executive orders. This is no uh, relief for anything. It, it is actually going to be a debt of loan, school loans to be transferred to others to pay. Republicans in Congress have accused the president of abusing the power of his office. Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas posted on X this morning saying that, I quote, President Biden is ignoring the Supreme Court and shamelessly raiding the Treasury. He is using your money to buy votes. According to last week's Marist National Poll, President Biden is trailing former President Donald Trump among millennials and Gen Z voters. It is expected that parts of this new effort by the Biden administration to offer student debt relief will come into effect before November's presidential election. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Elon Musk is entering a legal battle with Brazil's most influential Supreme Court justice. Musk says he's defying court orders to censor certain accounts. Because of that, the high court is now investigating him for alleged obstruction of justice. NTD's Arian Pastar is in Brazil with the details. Brazil's Supreme Court wants X, formerly known as Twitter, to suspend certain popular accounts. Now, Elon Musk says that the court doesn't allow him to publish the names of the accounts that are supposed to be suspended. And he says that he doesn't actually know why they should be suspended. All we do know is that this is part of the court's investigation into former President Jair Bolsonaro. Now, because of these aggressive demands, Elon Musk now says that Brazil is slowly becoming a dictatorship. I ask the people here in Brazil to see if they share the same concerns. O Brasil está virando uma ditadura. 
I totally agree with Elon Musk. This is how Venezuela started. We know that it's dangerous to have communists in the government. Venezuelans are fleeing to Brazil. Where can we go to? Argentina? The ocean? There's nowhere to go. I don't agree with Elon Musk, not at all. Brazil is a full democracy and all rights are being guaranteed. Brazil's Supreme Court has been investigating alleged misinformation used to overturn the 2022 presidential election. This started after January 8, 2023, when people breached government buildings in the country's capital. Similar to what happened on January 6 in the U.S. Musk says we do not know which posts are alleged to violate the law. We are prohibited from saying which court or judge issued the order or on what grounds. Despite not being allowed to talk about it, Musk later said that the person behind the order was Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes. Musk says that de Moraes wants him to suspend the accounts of sitting members of parliament and that he threatened to arrest our employees and cut off access to X in Brazil. Lastly, the entrepreneur says that X will publish everything demanded by Alexandre de Moraes and how those requests violate Brazilian law. This judge has brazenly and repeatedly betrayed the constitution and people of Brazil. He should resign or be impeached. Musk also says that such government overreach could take place in the U.S. too in the future. De Moraes has not responded to the comments. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. A county in Colorado is fed up with the buses dropping off thousands of illegal immigrants. Leaders there are now taking action, threatening to fine and seize the buses. NTD's Eileen Eng has more. In Douglas County, Colorado, the Board of Douglas County Commissioners voted unanimously on April 2nd to ensure only the planned, scheduled, and documented commercial passenger vehicles may arrive in unincorporated Douglas County. Under the new ordinance that went into effect immediately, undocumented buses carrying illegal immigrants could be fined up to $1,000 per person. In addition, the vehicle may be deemed a public nuisance under the law and may be seized. During a town hall meeting last month, Douglas County commissioners discussed the homeless crisis and buses of illegal immigrants coming in. We're going to count the individuals off that bus that were going to be dumped here in the county. It'll be a $1,000 fine per person and per passenger on that bus that was intending to drop them here in, in Castle Rock, maybe in Lone Tree up the Cabela's. Then we're going to seize that bus. We're going to drive it to the Sheriff's Department's impound lot. And um, you know what? If, if uh, the bus company does not respond to pay that fine, um, we're probably going to sell that bus along with all the drug dealers, sports cars, and boats that uh, the Sheriff's Department has seized up until that point. Teal said the passengers will be taken to a shelter in Denver first. He said if they have to, they would drop them off in New York City or Los Angeles. The first thing we want our community to know about this issue is that we are compassionate. And we understand why people want to migrate to America, and especially to Douglas County. We also want people to understand that our resources are limited, and we are working to balance our compassion with those limited resources as well as the safety of our community. The commissioner cited New York Times, which reported that by the end of January 2024, Denver saw more than 40,000 migrants, more per capita than any other city in the U.S. According to a recent statewide survey by the Colorado Polling Institute, illegal immigration is also a top issue for voters. Over 600 likely voters answered, and at number one, with 14% of the responses, was illegal immigration. Homelessness took the number two spot, with 12%. The Senate is set to pick up the impeachment case against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas this week. Here's the timeline. The articles of impeachment will be presented to the Senate on Wednesday. That's when the trial officially begins. House impeachment managers will act as prosecutors against Mayorkas. Senators are scheduled to be sworn in as jurors on Thursday. Mayorkas faces two articles of impeachment. The first article charges him with refusal to comply with the law. The second accuses him of breach of public trust. It's estimated that over 10 million illegal immigrants cross the border under the Biden administration. The Democrat-controlled Senate is widely expected to dismiss the impeachment trial against Mayorkas.
Former President Trump's campaign announces a major fundraising record, $50 million at a single event in Florida on Saturday. Joining me now to discuss this figure as well as the broader picture of Trump's campaign is Epic Times reporter Janice Heisel. She's been following Trump's campaign this election season. Janice Heisel, thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you back on the show. Thank you. Now, Trump raised over 50 million this weekend. How historic is this? Well, you know, that was the largest total ever raised in a single day from a fundraiser for political purposes. So it was a pretty momentous uh, occasion. And uh, it's a big deal considering that Joe Biden just had a really big fundraiser too, but it was pretty much double for one president versus what three presidents, Biden, uh, Clinton, and also um, Obama were all there for the event for Biden in New York. So uh, that's what the Trump campaign is pretty much uh, putting out there. One president versus three, and he, he's got double the, the number. And what kind of donors are backing Trump or who, are, who was at this event for him? The person who was hosting the event was John Paulson, who is a hedge fund manager. Uh, there were many uh, other hedge fund managers, but also people who own hotels such as Steve Wynn, uh, known for the Wynn Hotel there in Las Vegas. Another uh, hotel owner, um, Phil Ruffin, who owns Circus Circus, as well as Treasure Island in Las Vegas. And then uh, there was also a gentleman named um, Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Airspace. So kind of a variety of multi-billionaires who were there. And recently we did see a lot of Democratic strategists slamming Trump, saying he's cash-strapped, noting, as you mentioned, Biden's 25 or $26 million campaign raised in New York City with all the other uh, former presidents. And Biden has pulled in about $90 million in March with the campaign heading into April with about $192 million on hand. How does Trump compare to that? The Republican National Committee still has about $40 million shy of the total for the Democrat National Committee, even with the Trump number included. Uh, so they do have some ground to make up there, but um, I don't think they're necessarily as cash-strapped as being portrayed, but they do have some ground to make up, it looks like, for sure. And on that note, Trump does have a slew of legal cases ongoing. What do we know about how he's going to be using these new funds? Is it for campaigning, for those legal battles? Do we know? That specific part of it, we haven't been told. But I do know that there's a joint fundraising agreement where uh, apparently when Trump raises money, it will go to the RNC, the Republican National Committee, as well as to uh, you know, some state GOP uh, campaigns. There is an agreement about it being distributed, kind of sharing the wealth. Janice Heisel, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Could a technicality keep President Biden off the general election ballot in Ohio? The problem is the timing of the Democratic National Committee's selection process for presidential candidates and a deadline set by the Ohio Secretary of State's office for certifying the nominee. Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose raised this issue in a letter to Ohio Democratic Chair Liz Walters. LaRose pointed out the deadline for certifying a presidential candidate to his office is August 7th, 2024. But the Democratic National Convention, where the nominee is typically chosen, is scheduled for August 19th, 2024. To fix the problem, LaRose suggests either Ohio's lawmakers pass an exception to the rule or the Democratic National Committee holds its convention earlier. Florida is no longer exactly a swing state. The Republican Party is gearing up for the 2024 election with a growing lead in voter registrations. There are now almost 900,000 more registered Republicans than Democrats in the state, as reported by Florida's Voice. Republicans have been steadily increasing their lead, especially since the end of the pandemic. Just in March alone, Democrats lost over 1,000 voters, while Republicans gained over 30,000. Governor Ron DeSantis wrote on X that prior to 2021, Florida never had more registered Republicans than Democrats. Now a million voter advantage is within reach. 
An expert panel zooming in on China's disinformation campaign targeting Taiwan. With the 2024 election just around the corner, what can the U.S. learn from the Democratic Island? NTD's Sam Wong has the details. A panel of experts spoke in Washington, D.C. today about the Chinese Communist regime's disinformation campaign targeting Taiwan. From its cyberspace to its presidential election, the small democratically governed island has been a main target of China's influence operations. Taiwan's experience is broadly applicable to the international community. The use of the information space, the use of the social media, the use of technology that they are applying, at least in the Taiwan case study, is not only limited to Taiwan. For decades, the Chinese Communist Party has viewed Taiwan as a breakaway territory and has vowed to take it back by force if necessary. That's despite never having ruled it. According to digital defense organization DoubleThink Lab, Beijing has been flooding the island's information space with rumors. These narratives reportedly came from fake social media accounts, which makes it harder to trace them to their source. Our uh, comprehensive report documenting at least 84 narratives on U.S. skepticism, discrediting the U.S. itself as a country and also discrediting the Taiwan-U.S. partnerships. A recent report from Microsoft found an uptick in disinformation targeting Taiwan's political figures during election time. Analysts say transparency is crucial in order to protect free speech and debunk the disinformation targeting the island. In the civil community, we need to like um, transparent and open all of the results of the factual report. Well, why we do this is because we want a healthy democracy. It's not because we want to get rid of something or we don't want something in our country. With America's 2024 presidential election just around the corner, experts say Taiwan could serve as a case study for the U.S. Taiwan has so many experience and knowledge can offer the American government to, to uh, prevent or push back the disinformation from all over the world. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Sam Wong, NTD News. In the event that China attacks Taiwan, newly introduced legislation would require the U.S. to terminate the U.S.-China tax treaty. NTD's Jason Blair has more. The U.S.-China tax treaty was signed in 1984. It's designed to prevent double taxation for companies and individuals who do business in both countries. Representative Tony Gonzalez introduced new legislation that would require the U.S. Department of Treasury to cease the treaty if China launches an armed attack on Taiwan. Tony Gonzalez said in a statement, quote, ensuring the safety and security of our partners in the Indo-Pacific region is essential to our nation's economic and national security endeavors. This legislation sends a clear message to the Chinese Communist Party. If you invade Taiwan, severe consequences will follow. Co-sponsor Don Davis said, quote, we must deter unprovoked aggression because a threat to democracy anywhere is a threat to democracy right here at home. The bill, H.R. 7874, is currently waiting to be heard by the House Committee on Ways and Means. Senator John Cornyn also introduced a version of the bill in the U.S. Senate. Jason Blair, NTD News. And for analysis into Trump's stance on abortion and the reactions it's gotten, we are joined by legal analyst Gerard Felitti. He's a political strategist and senior counsel at the Lawfare Project. Gerard, thanks for joining us. Trump says abortion should be left to the states now. Biden, meanwhile, has promised to restore Roe v. Wade as the, quote, law of the land. To begin, break down the legal elements of this. What does the Constitution say or not say about abortion? Well, right now, what President Trump is saying about abortion is precisely what the Supreme Court said, that since Roe v. Wade is no longer the law of the land, it's up to the individual states to set the laws that they want with respect to what their citizens are allowed to do. So Donald Trump is correct on the law that as things stand now, it is a state's rights issue. Uh, but what President Biden wants to do is he wants Congress to pass a law that makes it a uniform process throughout the country. Hmm. Now, many pro-lifers are comparing Trump's states' rights argument to the argument made in favor of slavery. Others have argued that if you want action on abortion at the federal level, then you need to change the Constitution, as was done with slavery in the 13th Amendment. What do you make of this slavery comparison and the legal argument surrounding it? Well, there is something to be said for having uniformity, for having a constitutional amendment, or for having a law passed at the national level. The, the problem with states is that you will have inconsistent laws. You will have abortion completely outlawed in one state 
completely allowed in another, and you'll have different conditions in, in various states. And that level of uncertainty in an environment where people can simply get up and travel across borders to have an abortion or to not have one, that makes it a, a, an implausible system where you have 50 different states with potentially 50 different laws. Just like with slavery, if you want to favor one side or the other, you need that uniformity. You need the federal government, you need Congress to step in and establish what the law of the land is. And Trump's abortion stance is proving to be a divisive one among Republicans. Several prominent conservative pro-lifers have come out today condemning his position. How do you see this issue playing out within the Republican Party? Could a split within the party over this issue have any real impact? It, it can and it has. There are already plenty of Republicans who are not happy with the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. There are many people within the Republican Party who do believe that abortion should be a right, that should be unfettered action access to abortion. And this is rather a divisive issue for Republicans. Traditionally, it's not been a winning issue. Even when the party was more unified against abortion, it was not winning the hearts and minds of the vast majority of Americans. So the issue for the Republican Party is fraught with danger in the polls. And as we've seen in some of the primary races and in the midterm elections so far, this is not an issue that Republicans are polling well for. To your point, Trump also mentioned IVF, which dominated headlines after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos had the same legal status as children. Now, as a matter of strategy, is Trump likely positioning himself on these issues to win over moderates and women come November? He may well be trying to, but so far it's difficult to see how he has a lot of success for the simple reason that no matter what he says, there's a portion of Americans and even Republican voters that are not going to agree with him. Uh, he came out and said that this is a state's right issue, and immediately you saw backlash from Republicans saying that it didn't go far enough to uniformly ban abortion, and at the same time it doesn't appease Republicans who believe that abortion should be a right. So this is, even for President Trump and his popularity, it's a very dangerous issue that there's no seemingly right answer for, and people will vote with their conscience when it comes to the election in November. Is there a way in which this strategy would be successful, as in the abortion issue? It's, it's difficult to see how the strategy is effective without having a national law. When Roe v. Wade was the law of the land, you could either oppose it or grudgingly accept it, but it was unifying for the Republican Party. Now that there is no one law and each state is free to do its own, it perpetuates this whole issue it, into a myriad of disputes, into a myriad of elections, and it's very difficult for the party to come together. So until there is something more unifying for the party, a more consistent stance on abortion, this will continue to plague the Republicans going forward in these elections. Gerard Felitti, political strategist and senior counsel at the Lawfare Project, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you. The United States is preparing for a significant Iranian attack on U.S. or Israeli assets in the region as soon as this week. That's according to an unnamed senior official with the Biden administration. The threat comes after an Israeli strike in Syria killed Iranian commanders last week. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more on that and an exclusive interview by Kelly Wright, the host of America's Hope, who sat down with former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren. A senior Biden administration official says they believe an attack by Iran is inevitable. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Sunday, the U.S. is prepared to respond swiftly if necessary against any attacks by Iran or its proxies. I know the president and his team are working hard to prevent escalation and are pre prepared to defend any attack and respond swiftly if, if necessary. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Michael Oren says Israel is facing multiple potentially existential threats. One such threat, according to Oren, is Hezbollah in the north, backed by Iran, which he says has between 150 and 170,000 rockets. And the estimate, Israeli estimate for the rocket fire daily that we would be receiving from Hezbollah is between two and 6,000 rockets a day, which is just really, truly inconceivable. Other threats, he says, include Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria, the Houthi terrorists in Yemen, and Iran itself. Oren warns against underestimating what is at stake in Israel's war against Hamas. Evil is a force in the world that, whether you call it Satan, the devil, 
Um, it doesn't matter. Evil exists in the world. And, and we saw it in full display on October 7th, because that was truly an evil. And we are up against that evil. And I'll, see, I'll put a finer point on it. If we don't succeed in this war, if we do not defeat that evil, other countries and other societies are next. The war between Israel and Hamas has now reached the six-month mark. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And while he was in Israel, Kelly also spoke to the family members of hostages and others to hear how they're coping. Michael Levy's brother Orr is being held hostage in Gaza. Orr's wife was confirmed dead. My brother is an innocent civilian. He lost his wife who was murdered in front of his eyes. He had a two and a half year old boy who was waiting for him at home. And his story is the same of 133 other stories of hostages. The couple arrived at the Nova Music Festival shortly before Hamas terrorists carried out the massacre. Levy says at the end of the day, it's a human story. It's not about Israel versus Palestinians. My brothers and his wife's only crime was that they wanted to celebrate peace and love in a music festival. They didn't hate anyone. They want to live in peace with the Palestinians. But they were brutally attacked by monsters. Levy says the terrorists will strike again if the world won't wake up. Maybe in Paris, perhaps in New York or London. This, his face, is a human being with a family and hopes and dreams and a little boy who is waiting for his father to come back. Levy discusses his two-year-old nephew, who is now without a mom. What can I say? I mean, the day we had to tell him that uh, his mom won't come back, it was the hardest day of our lives. I mean, how can you tell a two-year-old boy that he won't get a hug from his mother? Jimmy Miller's cousin Shiri Bibas and her two kids, Ariel and Kafir, four years old and one year old, were taken hostage by Hamas from kibbutz near Oz. Shiri's husband and the father of the two boys was also taken hostage. They are not the, enemy, the enemies of the Hamas. And the Hamas took them over there to Gaza. And we don't know what's the situation of them. We don't know nothing about them. It's a very difficult situation. Miller hopes all the hostages will be reunited with their family soon. Because if we don't gonna have a good future with our families, nobody, even in Gaza, don't have a, don't gonna have any kind of future over there in this, in this territory. NTD's Kelly Wright has been talking to hostage families, rabbis and pastors, Jewish and Arab people, to hear their tragic stories and try to find a path toward healing. The America's Hope host will have a special report on what he learned coming out in just a few weeks. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Some scary moments aboard a Southwest Airlines jet yesterday. A plane that left Denver's International Airport for Houston had to make an emergency landing back in Denver after an engine cover fell off during takeoff and hit a wing. No one was hurt. The Federal Aviation Administration is investigating the incident. The FAA is also looking into several other recent engine issues on Southwest's fleet of Boeing planes. NTD's Don Ma spoke with an analyst on what's going on. Thanks for joining us here today, Jay. Uh, first thing I want your thoughts on, it seems like there's a lot of Boeing incidents recently. Any particular reason for that in your view? Well, I, I think it's getting a lot more attention. I mean, ever since Boeing at the end of December sent an email, sent an email out to airlines saying, keep an eye out for some missing bolts and nuts on the rudder control system of some of our Boeing 737 MAX aircraft. And uh, then, of course, it was two weeks later that we had the door plug blow off that Alaskan Airlines flight. And ever since then, it's been nonstop Boeing. So are you saying that we're seeing more reports of these incidents simply for the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, we're paying more attention to this company and that's why we're getting this? That's exactly the case. In the 33 years that I've been doing reports, uh, a lot of times these types of issues really don't make the news. Now, obviously, if you've got something like uh, the Southwest flight over the weekend, 3495, that had a part of the engine cowling come off, uh, we'll find out what took place. The FAA will be all over it to find out 
exactly what the issue here was. When we're talking about the, the cowling covers, if you want to get specific uh, on the aircraft, we've had more issues with Airbus cowlings that have started to come off than we have with Boeing. In fact, we have passengers right now that have been contacting me saying, Jay, for the first time ever, I'm looking for an all Airbus itinerary. Uh, I'm not even going to fly Boeing if I can help it. Final question real quick, tips and suggestions for travelers who are anxious. A lot of these airlines, United, Delta and others fly both Boeing and Airbus. And you may be booked on a Boeing uh, flight and you want to avoid that, so you change it to an Airbus. But if there's an aircraft swap where there's a problem, when you get to your hub, they may substitute your aircraft for an airplane you don't want to be on. So you really don't know what type of aircraft you're going to be on until you get to the airport and you're about to step on board. And airlines have been very forthcoming saying, look, if you're not comfortable flying a specific type of airplane, we will as best we can accommodate you on another one of our flights. Beijing's information war against the U.S. getting more sophisticated with the help of artificial intelligence. Take a look at this clip. It's an AI-generated animation spreading on Facebook and X. Inflation has heavily squeezed workers' incomes, but the rich are still cashing in, and the wealth gap widens. Ever seen a badge crack? Well, that's Uncle Sam's rep these days. This video clip comes from CGTN. It's an overseas arm of Beijing's mouthpiece, China Central Television. CGTN has a U.S. branch and has been pushing anti-American views for some time. But with AI, generating Chinese propaganda has become faster and easier. A Friday report from Microsoft says China has been increasingly using AI-generated content in recent months to sow division in the U.S. What's more, similar Chinese influence operations are also active on U.S. soil. One of them is a Facebook community page called The War of Somethings. It pushes Chinese Communist Party talking points, videos and articles that seek to paint the U.S. as a democracy in crisis. Take this post on the 2024 election, for example. The caption reads, quote, the campaign has turned everyone into a clown. Another Chinese influence operation also tried to persuade Americans not to vote in the 2022 midterm elections. Zooming out, the Chinese Communist Party spends big money to sway U.S. public opinion. It has burned over $300 million in this regard since 2016. That's only part of the budget. Beijing spends billions of dollars every year on its global campaign to push propaganda and shape public opinion about the Communist Party. When you look at the pieces of the puzzle and you put it together, you see a breathtaking ambition uh, on the part of the PRC to seek information dominance in key regions of the world. In the U.S., some of these influence efforts can be subtle, like this ad insert published on USA Today. At a glance, it looks like a news article that paints a positive image of Chinese leader Xi Jinping saying Xi's visit to an American school left an indelible mark on students. But look closer. You'll see a small line reading paid advertisement at the top. The ad was paid by China Daily, a Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece. And it's not just USA Today. China put similar ad inserts in some of the most influential American outlets, like Foreign Policy, Time Magazine, and the Los Angeles Times. China Daily also put similar ads in regional newspapers across the U.S., including the Seattle Times, the Houston Chronicle, the Boston Globe, and the Chicago Tribune. Senator Marco Rubio and Chuck Grassley wrote letters to these outlets in March, demanding they stop accepting money from China Daily. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on in college basketball, but let's start with the men's championship game, which is tonight. Now, most are picking UConn to win, so what does Purdue have to do to pull an upset? You know, I would think get UConn big man Donovan Klingon into foul trouble. I mean, that's not going to be easy. Now, everyone knows Purdue is going to pound the ball into Zach Eady and let him score down low. I mean, he's a two-time NCAA Player of the Year, and he's huge. 7'4", 300 pounds. But Klingon for UConn, he really matches up pretty well. He's 7'2", 280, but he's a very agile player, moves very well. If he's on the bench in foul trouble, Purdue can certainly dictate with Edie in the middle. Of course, UConn can do the same and try to get Edie into foul trouble, though I would think UConn will double-team Edie in the paint and hope someone besides Kling and really collects the fouls. Now, UConn, they've dominated this whole tournament. I mean, Saturday, was, that was their closest game yet, and they only won by 14 points. So I think Purdue will at least make this a close one, but I don't see Purdue cutting down the nets. Well, over in the women's game, South Carolina beat Iowa and Caitlin Clark yesterday for the title. How did they do it? 
you know, defense, especially in the second half. It looked like early on Clark was going to have a monster game. She scored 18 points in the first quarter. I mean, that's 10 minutes, but she only had 12 points the rest of the game. South Carolina really tightened up on them afterwards. By halftime, the Gamecocks already regained the lead, and they really imposed their will the second half. But I also thought Iowa missed some close shots around the rim that were makeable. I was also surprised when the game started getting away from them. Iowa really never called a timeout to try to regroup because the, the players looked like they were really brushing their shots in the final few minutes. But South Carolina, they were too tough. They were too deep. And now they're the first team to go undefeated since like 2016 at 38-0. So quite a season for South Carolina. While well, staying in college sports, the NAIA announced a transgender athlete policy change this week that allows only biological females in women's sports. Will the NCAA do the same? It doesn't seem like it. I mean, they released a statement in response today saying they'll, quote, make unprecedented investments in women's sports and ensure fair competition for all student athletes in all NCAA championships, end quote. Of course, they don't say how, and they're facing a lawsuit from more than a dozen former athletes accusing them of violating their Title IX rights by allowing former transgender swimmer Leah Thomas to compete at the national championships. And that includes Riley Gaines, who described in very emotional detail having to share a locker room with Thomas, who is a biological male, of course, whose ranking jumped from the 500s as a male to first in the female division. Now, the interesting thing is the NAIA said all athletes can play in men's sports, but only biological females who haven't begun hormone therapy can play in, in um, women's sports. Of course, there's never been a problem with uh, biological females playing in men's sports. Hmm. Well, now shifting gears to golf, Liv golfer John Rahm, who's ranked third in the world, recently suggested that if Liv switched to a 72-hole format, it would help reunite the sport. Does this seem likely to happen? No, it really doesn't. I mean, Liv does a 54-hole format, and the name Liv is just in Roman numerals for 54, L-I-V. So I don't see them changing that. Now, they also have a team golf format that really hasn't proved to be very popular, but those two features really make them stand out. I don't see them changing that in order to facilitate a merger with the PGA. Now, if they do merge, I mean, all bets are off because it certainly seems like a condition of any merger is who retains control, and it certainly seems like a, that's a deal breaker for the PGA. Now, although the more players that defect to live, like John Rahm, the more difficult this gets for the, the PGA because their product, of course, keeps getting diluted every time a major golfer leaves. I'm sure this will be a popular topic this week because you got the Masters starting Thursday. Rahm will be one of 13 live golfers to um, participate in this event, and he is the uh, reigning champion there. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tiff.